everybody. We are at the Warsaw Security Forum, and my next guest is Michał Baranowski from the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Hello, and thank you for joining us on TVP World. It's great to be with you. Now, uh, just for the purposes of discussion, I know you were in Kyiv uh, some time ago. We just saw President Zelensky go to the United States, where we were all very hopeful. Uh, that there would be some kind of breakthrough when he would express his victory plan to President Biden and all the other leaders that were there in New York for the UN General Assembly. Um, so please tell us, where do you think this trip went right and where do you think this trip went wrong? Well, there are a couple of very concrete deliverables that President Zelensky is bringing back from, from Washington, D.C., and most notably the $8 billion uh, aid package, military aid package, um, that includes new capabilities, they are being decided. It can, includes also two and a half billion dollars investment of American taxpayer in, in uh, defense industry in, in Ukraine. So that is on the positive side. There is also, I'm sure, also greater cooperation when it comes to initial rebuilding of Ukraine. Where it has not pan out well, especially when it comes to meetings with the administration, is it was very important for President Zelensky to receive a, a clear yes when it comes to extending the range of Western weapons operated by Ukrainians. Uh, basically, for, for, the, for the watchers, uh, viewers, right now, Ukrainian cities are attacked from the Russian territory, but Russians are, uh, but Ukrainians are not able to hit back. President Zelensky wanted to change it. That has not uh, come through. The other big thing is that President Zelensky was hoping to get a security guarantees from, from Biden that has also not pan out. Right, so uh, when looking at this, uh, the, War uh, the Wall Street Journal, excuse me, has, has described this four-point peace plan as, as actually nothing new. Nobody was impressed by this. Um, if you were to say what you think about this peace plan, uh, was there anything new? And it, was it just the uh, use of long-range weapons to strike Russian territory that was the kind of non-starter for the Americans? No, the biggest challenge for Americans is the request for security guarantees, because that's what Ukraine has right now is security arrangements with 20 few members, 28, I believe, members of the alliance. But none of them is a security guarantee. None of them right. obliges NATO members to go uh, to the aid of, of Ukraine. That would be critical for Ukrainian uh, security, but of course, this is what was the discussion. This, there was a discussion about this at the NATO summit, and uh, it was put aside because Ukraine is at war. Now, that security guarantees are key if we can imagine, if we f could imagine a stable peace in Ukraine, perhaps after some level of negotiation. So, this is not a crazy request. It just comes at the wrong moment, especially when it comes to U.S. presidential uh, calendar, you know, in the run, in the last weeks of U.S. presidential campaign. And part of this peace plan was to, um, well, to maneuver Ukraine into a situation where a sit down at the table would be possible. Uh, Russia has said that it will not, it will not sit down at the table. That's uh, right. There was the plans for the Switzerland Peace Summit too. Uh, that was supposed to come up before the U.S. elections, and then they kind of kicked that can down the road to November, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Uh, so what does Ukraine do in this situation? Well, most importantly, it is clearly Russia that does not want to sit down at the negotiating table. Um, Putin's war aims have not changed. He doesn't only want territory, which some misguided commentaries talk about trading territory for peace. Uh, his goal is still to conquer uh, the whole of Ukraine, and more, most importantly, to change the government in Kiev. He, right now, Russia is on the offensive, especially in the Donbas. Ukraine is holding Kursk, but Russia is not being pressed enough uh, to sit at the negotiating table. And this is why Ukraine is asking for 
more military capabilities for more long uh, range strikes to bring Russia to the negotiating table and negotiate something that is stable and just and not just a brief ceasefire. Right, that was a big message uh, in the United States. Uh, uh, not just a just peace process, but something that's stable and that's going to last. Um, but before we put the cart in front of the horse, let's go back to the situation in Kursk. So yeah. Ukraine is doubling down on this operation, saying that if it takes a chunk of uh, Russian territory, I've heard some experts say that they could take a small chunk of Russia and trade it for a much bigger piece of Ukraine. But if we look at the situation that is unfolding right now, today, in Volodar, on the, on the southern front, uh, which is a very important city, the situation near Pokrovsk, uh, Ukraine is, not, is losing ground, and it's steadily losing ground. Um, was this a good gamble for, because this was a political decision for President Zelensky and, his, uh, and General Sersky to go into Kursk and to commit forces there instead of holding the line in the east? Look, it's much e easier for us sitting hundreds of kilometers and other commentators sitting. And in 2020 hindsight. Absolutely. Yeah. To say that this was a good idea or not, not a good, good idea. Kursk has not played itself out yet. There is a, as you mentioned, I was in Kiev and I heard a case being made strongly by the Ukrainian side that, look, there are a few things that the Kursk offensive has shown. One is that Russia is not a 10 feet giant. It can be uh, pushed in its own territory. Secondly, that R Ukrainian forces in Russia doesn't mean escalation to tactical nuclear weapons. That was something that we worried about. Thirdly, it showed that mm. Putin doesn't really care about his own people. And that has a political effect with inside Russia. So th these all still, ho this holds true. What is true at the same time is that uh, the hope that Russia will have to move forces from the south to the north has not pan out. And therefore, Ukraine continues to lose ground, to lose territory in the, in the south, in Donbass. In the meantime, uh, Vladimir Putin has set uh, more red lines. It seems like he's trying to get the West to um, kind of self-contain itself, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, by changing the nuclear, contemplating changing the nuclear doctrine of Russia. Is this, uh, is this red line that the Western uh, politicians and decision makers need to be worried about? It's a line that they are worried about. Let's put it this way. Uh, it's very clear that Putin's word, words were taken seriously enough to give a pause on the Western side. Many of observers can second guess this, this decision. For me, the more telling thing is that the people who are least worried about nuclear escalation, because this is what Putin is threatening. He's threatening that he will hit Ukraine with small tactical nuclear weapons. You know who's not afraid of this? Ukrainians. Ukrainian people, Ukrainian government thinks that both these threats are not credible and points out to the fact, to the atrocities that Russia is, has already committed and pointing out also that if Putin hit Ukraine with tactical nuclear weapons, it would hurt Russia by directly. So it is striking for me that the countries that that sit under nuclear umbrella are far away, are more worried about it than people on the front lines facing these weapons most directly. And that's something that we really can see with our own eyes uh, as, as a reality. Perhaps the politicians should take note. Michal Baranowski from the German Marshall Fund in the United States, thank you very much for joining us today here. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that's all for now here from the Warsaw Security Forum. Thanks for watching and stay with us for more.